friends, and welcome to another episode of our chapters on Armstrong Television. This is a show that profiles authors, editors, publishers, and all sorts of people in the book realm for you to learn more about their process and the books that they write. I'm your host, Carter Seaton, and it's a delight to have you with us. Today, our guest is award-winning novelist, Wally Cash, and we are so delighted to have him. And I'm so delighted to be able to call him my friend. Wally is the New York Times bestselling author of A Land More Kind Than Home. He's also the author of two other previous novels, This Dark Road to Mercy and The Last Ballad, all of which I was a huge fan. He's been a fellow at prestigious writing retreats, one called Yaddo and the other, The McDowell Colony. And he teaches fiction writing and literature at the University of North Carolina, Asheville, where he serves as the alumni author in residence. His new novel, When Ghosts Come Home, was published just last September. He lives in North Carolina with his wife, photographer Mallory Cash, and their two adorable daughters. Welcome to Chapters, Wiley. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you, Carter. Thanks for, thanks for letting me be on and joining you. We're, we're delighted. All right, your book has been described alternately as a gripping mystery, an exploration of race, justice, and grief, as well as a family drama. That's quite a mixture of storylines, and it's a terrific novel, and I think it demands more than one reading, at least in my opinion. But can you give us a brief synopsis and then tell us what inspired this book? So the novel takes place in the fall of 1984, uh, just a few days before the, um, the 1984 election, and it opens in the middle of the night when a local sheriff just off the coast of North Carolina and Oak Island, North Carolina, is awakened in the middle of the night by the sound of a low flying aircraft passing over his house. And he knows there is no good reason for a plane of this size to be coming in this late at night to an airport this small. So he drives out to the airport and what he finds there changes the life and his life forever. He finds an abandoned DC-3. It's a World War II era cargo plane. It's too large for the runway. It's sitting sideways at the very end of the runway. It's been abandoned. They don't even find any fingerprints in it. And he also finds alongside the runway the body of a local man who's been shot dead and left behind. And so that's how the novel opens. But as you said, um, I tried to have an exploration of, of race in, in the mid-1980s and, and, and draw parallels to, to many of the same issues we're facing today. And I, it, is a, it is a novel about grief and family and and identity and, and coming to terms with who we are, with who our parents are. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about the novel and where the idea came from, what inspired it is a couple of things. You know, all my novels are set, you mentioned my first three books are all set in Western North Carolina, whereas, whereas I'm from really, I'm at the place that I call home. But we moved down to the coast of North Carolina in um, the fall of 2013. And my wife is from this area and both of our daughters were born in this area. And I understood pretty quickly that if I was gonna to get to know this place the way that my kids and my wife automatically know it, I was gonna to have to write about it. And so When Ghosts Come Home is a, it's a novel that I think brought me closer to this region, to these people, to its history. And I think it brought me closer to my wife and to my children as well. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that's good. Um, it's got some great characters in it. Are any of them patterned after somebody that you've ever met or known? Uh, particularly, I'm thinking about Bradley Fry, or is he just the uh, <laughs> the typical, stereotypical, if you want to say it, racist? <laughs> well, Bradley Fry is, um, the, the sheriff of the novel is named Winston Barnes, and the sheriff is locked in a tough re-election battle. He's in his mid-60s. He is you know, people are beginning to doubt his capability of doing this job, given his age, his wife is ill with cancer, his daughter has faced her own tragedies, and he's in a tough kind of mental spot when the novel opens, and his challenger is half his age, he is wealth, very wealthy, mm -hmm. he's running TV ads, which the sheriff can't even begin to attempt to do, um, he's the son of a local land developer, he's a rich guy, there's a part in the novel where it says, that he confused money with brains. And he's just a rich kid who never had to work that hard, who inherited all of his dad's money, who can afford to be a nationalist, who can afford to, 
to be cruel, who can afford not to forge relationships with people. And so that's who Bradley Fry is. And he was inspired by a lot of kids that I grew up with. You know, um, I grew up in a, a very middle class family, but I was raised around a lot of wealthy kids. And, and I knew a lot of kids like Bradley Fry. I know a lot of adults like Bradley Fry mm -hmm. who think I've the world is owed to them. Here. Yeah, who think the world is owed to them because either somebody along the way worked hard or got lucky. And now they've got a lot of power. And mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, Bradley Fry is just a guy. And after this novel came out, I heard from so many people who said, oh my gosh, Bradley Fry played on my basketball team. Bradley Fry went to my church. Bradley <laughs> Fry was my college roommate. You know, so many of us know, know guys like that. And, and of course, he's, and he's a racist, but of course he is. Like, of course, Bradley Fry's a racist, you know. And, and he's, he's, I hope he's less of a stereotype and more of a distillation yeah. of a, a particular trope of especially Southern manhood. Mm -hmm. I understand that, yeah. Which comes to you first, a character, a theme you want to explore, or an idea for the plot? Well, for this one, the idea came early. You know, I heard a story when we moved back down here to the coast in 2013. I heard a story about an airplane that had landed out at the Oak Island Airport that was too large for the runway and uh, a stunt pilot had to be flown in to fly it away. And I never looked into that because I said, stop there. That's all I need to know. I'm going to run with that. And so I had that idea and I knew that there would be some kind of law enforcement element required in that story. And so I just came up with this sheriff. And then from there, the novel kind of takes over, the, the characters kind of take over. So I have, a, I have an idea for the setup for a book, mm -hmm. but I don't know how the book's going to end. And I, I still didn't know how this book was going to end until really late in the editing stage. I, I tried a series of of endings over the course of writing this book, none of, none of which really fit. Um, so it was a long time getting to the ending, but the whole time the characters were with me, kind of pushing me on, giving me new ideas, bringing me back to the page. Well, that, that brings me to my next question. For those of you in the audience who don't know these two terms, writers say they are either plotters, which means they know the plot before they start off, or they are pantsers, meaning they write by the seat of their pants. Clearly, you did not plot this out all the way. <laughs> no, I didn't. And, you know, I wish I had, but I just don't really know how to do that. You know, I just don't know. My strength is not in building a plot. My strength, I believe, is in creating believable, sympathetic characters that yeah. readers root for and then putting them in situations to either do the wrong thing or the right thing. I totally and, agree. Yeah. And that's what I like doing because that's interesting to me. You know, people who are capable of doing the right thing and then on the next page doing the wrong thing, all of us are that way. And right. so that, that's, that's just so much more interesting to me. Yeah. Um, I heard Barbara Kingsolver say one time that she starts off in a sense with a theme, something that she wants to worry about. Uh, for instance, with, I think it was flight behavior, it had to do with the environment and the monarch butterflies. And then she finds characters that will be able to carry that theme out. Have you ever done that? Or is that something that you think about when you're work, working I on I think the theme is something that kind of finds the work. You know, I, sometimes I feel like for me, theme is the kind of thing you can look back on in hindsight, like the theme of your day, like, oh, the theme of my day ended up being procrastination. <laughs> the theme of my day ended up being, you know, leisure. Um, the theme for me is kind of something that finds its way after, after these characters have come. At least I try to make it that way. You know, I, don't, I try not to make anything too conscious. You know, I want to create, this sounds self-indulgent to say, but I want to create art. And I, I, I find that if I come to the page with too many expectations of what I need to do there, then it short circuits the effort of creating something genuine and real and urgent. And mm -hmm. so I try not to, to put too much pressure on myself to meet all of these thematic demands or political cultural demands. And, and those things kind of find their way in, obviously, because I don't live or write in a vacuum. Um, so those things certainly find their way in, but um, I don't try to do that. Now I can look back on when ghosts come home and say, you know, there are some themes here, fathers and daughters. Uh, racial animus, class, you know, 
class struggles, um, uh, provincial communities. I, I, you can find those themes, but I wasn't consciously, at least I was not trying consciously to think about those things. I see, okay, I understand. Uh, isn't this the first novel that's had a bit of a mystery in it? I think it is. You know, I've been called a mystery writer before. Uh, my second novel was a finalist for the Edgar Award for Mystery of the Year. And I was, while really thankful, I was a little embarrassed by that because I didn't quite think it belonged. Which one was that? Uh, the Stark Road to Mercy. Oh, yes. Um, I didn't think it belonged in that mystery category because when I think of mysteries, I think of really smart cerebral books that are able to fool the reader and the characters. And my first two books, Landmark Kind of at Home and This Dark Road to Mercy, whatever mystery there was in them, I was giving the reader all of the information. The mystery was waiting to see when the characters would all share the information mm -hmm. and what they were gonna do when they found out they had been double crossed or when they found out they had been lied to. The reader sees all of that and knows all of that is coming and the tension uh, lies in waiting to see when that's gonna be revealed. For when ghosts come home, this is a real mystery. You know, the characters right. don't know everything and the reader doesn't know everything. And it's right. really only in the last couple of pages where everything becomes clear, where the reader is a step ahead of the characters and then all of these things are revealed. And yeah. I was surprised by that. I felt very smart when I did that. I did it by accident, <laughs> but I felt smart nonetheless. Well, uh, you know, Tom Groom is very, very much a mysterious character. I mean, he just appears and um, you accept him at face value. And only, as you said, at the end, you question everything that you read about him. Yeah, I mean, we have to keep in mind that you know, the, the, there are three principal points of view in this novel. There's Winston, he's 65 years old. He's a white guy in 1984 from the South. There's his daughter, she's 25 years old. She's a law school graduate. She's just lost a newborn child. Mm -hmm. um, and she sees the world a certain way. You know, she's been to college and graduate school. She's moved around. She's young. She's, she's, she came of age in the 60s and 70s. And then we have this 14-year-old black kid from Atlanta named, named uh, Jay, who ends up being the brother-in-law, the younger brother-in-law of the man who found dead on the runway. And Jay is coming out of his father and mother's pressures of civil rights. And they are putting all of this pressure on him to be perfect, to be perfectly behaved. And he gets sent out to the country in North Carolina to live with his sister. And because he gets into trouble in Atlanta. But when he's there, he comes up against a strain of racism that he had never counted, encountered in Atlanta. So all of these characters, these three principles, see the world very differently. And so when you have things that cause a red flag for Colleen, 25-year-old law school graduate who came of age in the 60s and 70s, they're not going to be red flags for her father, who came uh -huh. of age in the 30s and 40s when we trusted institutions pre-Pentagon Papers, pre-Watergate you know, uh, Watergate scandal, right? Winston trust everything because he, he wasn't seasoned in the seasons of doubt of the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Well, his daughter is, so she questions everything. And that, that leads to a lot of tension in their relationship. Well, Jay is coming of age in the 1980s, the me generation, the generation when we are told that as American citizens, we deserve and should have it all. But some of us don't have very much. Um, and so Jay has this angst and this anger and this pressure and it, and it, and it builds up steam and, and, it, and it is exercised in, in kind of violent, destructive ways that, that progress him further into the story. Yeah, and I think you, you mentioned this earlier, the relationships between everybody, that, that is so, there's so much tension both underground and on the surface, like between Winston and Colleen and Jay and his parents or his grandparents. And yeah, there's a lot of, lot of personal um, stuff going on. Mm -hmm. That that's, must've been fun to write. It is, you know, the more I can get characters to interact and the more tension I can discover, the more tension points I can discover in their relationships, then the more I have to write about. 
-hmm. if, if characters don't conflict with one another, I don't have much of a story. Yeah. A, a day when everything goes smoothly and you don't fight with your spouse or your kids or your colleague or your sibling, those are good days. You're thankful for those days. But if somebody were watching a movie of your life, that wouldn't be a very entertaining movie. Yeah. They'd right. be much more entertained by an argument or a fistfight or a jealousy or a heartbreak. You wouldn't be if it's your life. You don't want <laughs> but the viewer and the reader, that's what we, that's what we look for. Yeah. Um, how, when was your first novel out? And was it A Landmark Kind at Home? My first novel was A Landmark Kind at Home, and it came out in April of 2012. 12, okay. So when you got to the top of the, you know, the bestseller list, and then started on another novel. Did you worry that it would never measure up to that? <laughs> I, I was really lucky. I wrote A Land More Kind Than Home. By the time my editor purchased that novel in a two book deal, I had pretty much completed A Land More Kind Than Home. We did some really fine tuning on the novel and he improved it exponentially. But the pressure to write a novel with a big publishing house and an editor looming over your shoulder was gone. I didn't have that with my first novel. I wrote that novel essentially in secrecy and early morning hours and finding time when I could. So that was kind of a delicious anonymity. And I wrote my second novel. I wrote the first drafts of my second novel before my first novel came out. Oh, okay. So I was really fortunate there as well. Now, I was doing a lot of the rewrites and the cuts and a lot of the edits while I was on book tour for Land More Kind at Home. Um, a Land More Kind Than Home came out in hardcover in April 2012, and I was on the road from mid-May through October. I mean, I toured for that book relentlessly, nonstop, all over the country. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then the paperback came out in January. So I was back on the road from January all the way through May in some instances. And I remember that I turned in the final edits for this dark road to mercy in May of 2013. Um, and it came out in January of 2014. Um, so, you know, I didn't have a lot of lag time between those two books. People think that I wrote this dark road to mercy really quickly, but I didn't. I wrote it maybe in two and a half years, but, I, but there was such a long lead time. But I did feel that pressure with The Last Ballad because both of those books came out and they did really well. They were both reviewed really well. They won some prizes. And so I felt a lot of pressure with The Last Ballad. And The Last Ballad was also something very different for me. It was historical right. fiction. It was a much richer novel. It was a heavily researched novel. It was a very labored over novel. It was a much larger novel. Expand, it spanned 100 years in the history of the South. Um, had way more characters. I felt a lot of pressure with The Last Ballad to get that book exactly right. And I think, I think I got it as close to right as my talents will allow, but that was definitely the most pressure. With When Girls Come Home, I didn't feel as much pressure. You know, I, I you know, established some kind of reputation for what I can do and, and what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And so there weren't a lot of surprises with this fourth book. It's different in that it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. um, and I think all my books are, are different in some ways and similar in mm -hmm. others, but it, you know, the pressure just comes so much later. The pressure of a readership comes so much later because when I'm working on a book, I don't, it doesn't, it, it's not even in my wildest dreams that anybody's ever going to read it. It doesn't even register to me that anyone beyond my agent and my wife and my editor are going to read it. <laughs> it's not until the very end when we're looking at the first pass pages and we've got the the red pencils correcting, you know, <laughs> yes, tractions that I think, oh my God, somebody's going to read this. Should I have tried harder to make this more perfect? You know, and of course I've done everything I can, but that's really the first time yeah. doubt creeps in that I really think, is this ready to go out? That's, that's really the first time that happens. Do you enjoy the touring? Some people I do. don't. I really enjoyed it for my first for my first two books. Um, I did, you know, because uh, we'd been living in West Virginia. When, when my first novel came out, we were living in, in, in Morgantown, West Virginia. And we hadn't 
you know, I, I grew up in North Carolina, spent a lot of time in, in Louisiana and touring was a way for me to reconnect with old friends, to meet readers, to get to know booksellers, to visit bookstores and libraries that I'd heard about for a long time, like Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi, which is a historic store, you know, famous store. Um, all of these bookstores uh, I had never gotten to visit. And so touring was, was like, you know, I was in a rental car, just cruising up and down all over the country from, you know, Seattle to, gosh, Mobile, Alabama to Houston, Texas to uh, Portland, Maine, you know, just going oh, all over the place. You and new people yeah. and going to bookstores and seeing old friends. And that was really fun. But then when we had kids, I went on tour for Last Ballad and just did my God, over two years, I probably did a hundred events, if not more. I mean, I did, I did so many events and they were all in person. We weren't doing anything virtual then mm -hmm. um, in 2017 when the last ballad came out. And we had a three-year-old and a one and a half year old. And it was hard being away from yeah. them, really, yeah. really hard. And it's hard because I'm, I'm attached to them emotionally. It's also hard because, you know, leaving that burden to my wife when, when I'm, when I'm touring is, is unfair to her. And it's a challenge for her to get her stuff done that she has to get done on her, her work. And so that really complicates things. So, you know, I wanted to go back on the road with when ghosts come home, my wife always encourages me go everywhere you're invited, go to every bookstore, every library that'll have you, um, every university, especially if you're getting paid, um, go everywhere. <laughs> But, you know, this time was a little bit different. I had a, I had a much smaller book tour. A lot of my events were outside. A lot of them were virtual. Um, yeah. But that was fine. You know, I've done the big book tour. I've been on the road for three months. I've stayed in every La Quinta from here to San Antonio. <laughs> every, I've eaten, uh, you know, McDonald's cheeseburger in every airport in America. Or, you know, it, it, we think touring is going to be this luxurious no. And, and and to be honest, my publisher, when they send me out on tour, they do put me up in really nice hotels. And I always think, could we could we save money and go on a longer book tour and be in less nice hotels? <laughs> but the pressure of book tour is a lot. You know, if you go to a city like New Orleans, you hit the ground at one o'clock in the afternoon and your events at six. It's one o'clock in the afternoon and you still got to get your rental car and check into the hotel and take a shower. And then you've got five friends in town that want to go have drinks after your event. Uh -huh. And you're feeling the pressure to get the best chicken and sausage gumbo in the city. And then the next day you're flying out at eight in the morning. You're, it's, it's not, you end up eating room service grilled cheese at midnight, kind mm -hmm. of buzzed watching, you know, hoarders on A&E. You know, after you've been out late. It's uh -huh. not. You know, I always think it's going to be awesome, but it ends up being exhausting and yes. uh, I miss my family, but I get to see my friends and make new friends. And that's really fun. Okay. I've had some great adventures on book tour and made a ton of friends with booksellers and librarians and other authors that I've long admired. So that's been a really, really great part of it. Yeah, I think I met you the first time at the University of Virginia. Yeah, yeah. So that was a uh, while well, back. Probably the Virginia Book Fest. Yes, it was. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Um, so with, with all of that having been said, obviously you must have to do that during the summer for the, for the most part because you teach. Um, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a pretty, pretty cushy gig, though. I teach two classes a year at the University of North Carolina, Asheville, and I teach on Monday nights and Tuesday mornings. And I just, okay. teach one, I just teach one semester a year. So yeah. I do a lot of other work for the university. I do a lot of advancement work. I run a book club called the Common Word Community Read, a campus-wide, community-wide book club. Our uh, selection for this semester, I'll get it for you, is this really great book here, The Last Castle. It's about the Biltmore House, the building of the Biltmore oh, House. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. And um, so I put together discussion questions, organize lectures. I do a lot of the, the like work and things like that. But usually my spring semester is off. Uh, so I'll be writing a lot this semester and trying to get okay. some good work done. So summers and, and spring, I, I write. But this past semester, I taught two classes 
and was on book tour and it was it was a lot it was a very very busy semester and what are you working on now I'm working on another novel. This one is set uh, in uh, August of 2018 here in North Carolina, and it takes place in the days after the Silent Sam statue, the Confederate monument, is toppled by students on the campus at Chapel Hill. Excellent. That should be interesting. I'm sure there'll be plenty of good characters in that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Do you have a set writing routine? I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, we have little, little, not little kids, but we have, we have kids, we have little kids. We mm -hmm. have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old and um, they are in kindergarten, first grade. And so, you know, I like to start, I like to wake up at six in the morning, make coffee, bring it with me. I'm in my office right now. We run an office, my wife and I outside of our home. She's a photographer. And uh, if I can be at this office sitting at this desk by seven in the morning with pencil sharpened, write for three hours, two front and back pages of notebook paper, then I've had an incredible writing day. And when I'm in the throes of it, that's what I'll do. Uh, I'll be able to do that. But having these little, these little chickens at home, you know, I don't want to leave the house and again, leave all of that to Mallory, just sneak out of the house and say, all right, get them up, get them dressed, feed them, get them out the door. And so what we'll normally do is uh, I'll, I'll get up and I'll still get up early and have some coffee and uh, do breakfast, lunches and, and drive to school. And then I'll come over here and sit down at about 8.15 um, mm -hmm. and try to get all the work done that I can. Uh, but, but my real target time is about three hours a day, handwriting as much as possible, two front and back pages. And I'll, I'll have had a really good day if I can do that. It's interesting you should say that you handwrite. Um, that's how I started, was handwriting. Mm -hmm. um, legal pad, number two pencil, this whole nine yards. And um, I felt like I got better, better work done that way than even now that I've transitioned to doing it on a computer. Do you feel that there's some kinetic connection between your brain and your hand and the piece of paper? Yes. Yeah. And what it is for me is I can type, I don't type correctly, but I can type quickly and I can type faster than I can think. And so what ends up happening is I stare at my cursor because I've gotten all my thoughts down, yeah. but I can't write that quickly, especially with the pencil. And so my hand is always behind my thoughts and my thoughts are always like, catch up, catch up, catch up. Come on, get this on the page. And for a writer, that's what you want. You want to feel pressure to get down all this genius material. When I was typing, I would often feel like I was running out of material because I was typing it so quickly. And my mm -hmm. brain was not firing quickly enough to, to mm -hmm. follow the ideas. But That's now good. I've just got buckets of things to say when I handwrite. That's good. Um, your, um, your new work, do you always have another idea kind of percolating in the back when you're working on something? I do. Yeah. And I've got a couple right now that I would like to take a break from what I'm working on and, and try to hammer them out. But yeah, I do. I've always got something kind of nagging at me that tells me, you know, let this one go. Let this one go. It's, it's getting time to let this one go. It's like my brain knows that it's time to move on to a new book, that, I, that I'm going to have something else to say, something else to focus on. Hmm. How long? When did you decide you wanted to be a, a, a writer? Always? Are you one of those that knew when you were six that that's what you wanted to do? You no, know, I, I always liked reading a lot. And I, I went to college and majored in creative writing. But I, I didn't know that it was going to be a career, really. You know, I have a PhD in American Lit. And I thought I would be a college professor forever, like a, a, like a real one, not a, like a career <laughs> in residence, but a real one. Mm -hmm. Committee work and office hours and, you know, in my office all day and students coming in and, um, but, but writing wasn't conducive when I was working on my first book, you know, I was teaching eight classes a year for a semester and, and two of them were composition each. So I was teaching four composition classes a year to a semester, mm -hmm. just grading essay after essay. And then I was advising student majors and organizations and doing tons of administrative work. 
but I still wrote a novel. You know, I still wrote two novels actually because I would get up really early in the morning and I would go to bed early and I would take every available moment and having my summers off and make real sacrifices and not travel or go on vacation, I would work. But I knew it wasn't conducive to doing it forever. I couldn't teach a full load of classes and, and publish books and go on book tour and, 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 and speak at universities. And I, I couldn't do it. It's not, it's not possible. And, and right now, the desire to write books speaks to me more than the desire to, to have a full teaching load and, 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 and everything that requires. It's, yeah. it's not in me right now. Maybe it will be, but it's not in me right now. All right. Wally, this has been wonderful to talk to you. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I know we could spend another hour of talk shop about books and talk, write, uh, talk writing, but I think our time is up. So thank you so much for being with us. I hope all of you all will pick up a copy of When Ghosts Come Home because it is truly a, a really wonderful novel and you'll be enchanted just like I was. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you'll join us again next time. And I'm Carter Seaton and we'll see you again then. Take care. Bye-bye. Connect with Chapters through email. Write to lp4 at zoominternet.net. Chapters has a Facebook page at Armstrong Chapters. Like, subscribe, share, and comment. All Chapters episodes are available on YouTube. Visit the Armstrong Neighborhood channel on YouTube and look for a playlist of all the Chapters programs.